Herbert's hundred harem. The shyer girls of the family weren't all that encouraged by the prospect of going out, especially when they heard that the shuttle itself had been attacked by the Mar Yatha. Still, several of them had said perhaps next time, which was good enough for Esma. Apparently, it took outright decades of borderline begging in order to get some of her daughters to enjoy hunting at times, and her kids could be downright vicious compared to some members of their own races, so she knew better than to push them, or rather tried to directly tell him as some of the girls were getting a little jealous of all the time he was spending with Yzma, and he could only be alone in the bathroom at this point without at least ten, if not more, girls around him. They ship out the next day. Apparently David had been studying the shipping schedules and they were going to join a convoy of numerous cargo ships heading to Skathak and just sync up the flight plan with their own with a little exit strategy hooked up at the end. So for at least a day, Herbert gets the experience that most men in public do. Apparently this kind of detail is what it's like when a Tret marries into a Zidin and Yaoya family. Still, it's a hell of a thing to have an ever-shifting mass of girls either cuddling close as he explores this sky plate above Marabor and gets a feel for how this kind of space station is laid out. First off is that a place like this has slightly different feeling gravity. It's got a texture for lack of a better term, a sort of directional quality and evenness that is closer to a planet but is almost artificial. If gravity in its natural state is simply a weight to things, then a false one feels more akin to countless tiny strings in every part of your being pulling you the right way. He can almost feel the strings, but the weight is there too. It's a, a sort of consistency that is halfway between artificial and real gravity. Ships just don't have the density and don't move in the same way as worlds. So, of course, the gravity is different no matter how well it's faked. The girls move with him in a tide. There are ten very close to him in a defensive formation, not letting anyone outside really see him and more girls beyond that. The outer layer lets other women through, but the inner layer is very hard and doesn't let anyone close. It's like having a protection detail. They decide that they want to look at some of the more touristy things and he ends up being almost dragged into a museum. It shows the stuffed and mounted corpses of the first few Maryatha that made colonization all but impossible. Holding off a few of them for a short while is easily in the area of a modern shuttle, but these beasts were so aggressive that they would dig into a person's basement, empty the larder, then come up from below to attack the settlers. There's a reason no one had any sympathy for these predators. The leftover scraps and chunks of the first few failed colonization attempts were harrowing as some of them had clearly marked lines where the Mar Yatha had gouged the hypercrete that most of the galaxy used instead of concrete. It was harder, tougher, and very ugly, but it made an astoundingly solid foundation. Just slap a basic tarmac over it or a few gardens and you disguised it without compromising its sheer solidity. If the asteroid that punked the dinosaurs had been of hypercrete rather than whatever it had been made of then, there wouldn't have been an Earth after the shot. The stuff was dense and solid to the point that enough of it actually had its own microgravity. It was only ever used on planet-side construction for a very good reason. If a chunk drops from orbit, then its sheer heat resistance means it doesn't burn up in orbit and disproportionate weight means it hits like a shot from a railgun. And that's when it's the size of a softball. Scale those up and there was a casual way to just reduce cities into powder, which made the fucking claw marks in the stuff very, very disquieting. For such deadly creatures, they certainly died easily enough. But that was the arms race of nature, wasn't it? The things on the attack rarely need to defend because their offense is their defense, vice versa for prey creatures that don't attack. It makes a twisted sort of sense, which is why intelligence is such a game-breaking ability. You can plan out attacks to overwhelm offense and defense both. He notices an unusual Aramenta walk in, outright staring at the hypercrete samples. 
His girls ignore the newcomer, but there's a familiar niggling that Herbert gets when he starts to deal with the more aggressive or dangerous organizations, the sensations of goosebumps going up and down his back. He doesn't know what exactly it is, perhaps something in the posture or the way they're moving their eyes. Either way, the Aerumenta is up to something or planning something, but is it his business? He has no authority here and less stakes. He's leaving the next day and likely not to be back for a very long time, if ever. His girls notice his gaze and follow it. Is something wrong? He's asked. I think she's up to something, but the question is, is it our concern or the shattering of glass and an alarm going off as the Aramenta uses her axiom affinity to pull the hypercrete to herself and then smash the base of the display like an egg cuts him off. Fuck, here we go, Herbert remarks even as the Aramenta woman starts laughing like a lunatic. His opening plasma shot is countered by one of the smaller pieces of the hypercrete moving into position to block, and it simply splashes off without issue. Of course, these things survive re-entry with ease. Why the hell would a quick plasma splash do better? They needed extended contact in both the heat and gravity of a star to break down without extremely specialized equipment. He'll need to brush up on that after this, as a blade infused with axiom moving with enormous force seems to be the only thing in the area that can damage the girl's armor weapon. Scatter, he calls out to his girls, and most do, but the few that don't he has to pull out of the path of a hypercrete pummeling. He fires off two more shots of plasma, not that he thinks he'll hit the girl, but because by blocking she'll blind herself for a moment or two. Time enough for him to pull the girls into some form of cover and stand out in the open to soak up the attention. He prefers a fight to be at the end of a sniper rifle or done in one blow. But there are too many unknowns about the situation and he needs to gather information as much as he needs to put down the attacker. So, who am I fighting today? Herbert asks, pushing a touch of Meccan accent into his tone. Not enough to really change the words, but the almost Germanic lilt to his tone is enough to make her think numerous things about him. Oh, eye candy for the tour guides? Not a bad idea, but you're in luck for you get to see the rise of the stoned, she announces, and Herbert does not laugh. He does not mock her. He does not sneer. He wants to. He really wants to. But he doesn't. The stoned? You do know that hypercrete is an exceptionally dense chemical compound that requires a colossal laboratory with gravitational compressors in order to create right? Calling it a stone is like calling a comet an ice cube, only correct in the most technical of senses, Herbert asks needling the woman and throwing some techno babble at her to see if she'll try to correct or argue with him. It is stone perfected. No cause for pathetic crystals or metals. No need for vile plant matter or other weaknesses. Stone purified, she bellows out, and Herbert refuses to roll his eyes. He wants to, but he doesn't. So who are you running distraction for? No one's this stupid deliberately, Herbert remarks, and she pauses for a moment and he grins. He got her. She's a distraction. You think the stone needs any kind of cut the crap cupcake. I'm supposed to be on vacation, but that doesn't mean I can't make you tell me your every deep, dark secret. Herbert cuts her off and she gives him an odd look. You think the stone is afraid of... She begins and Herbert blurs forward grabs her around the forehead and sends a disrupting pulse of axiom into her. Her control of the hypercrete chunks is completely disrupted, and the biggest chunk, the one with the clearest claw mark, embeds itself in the floor of the museum, and the smaller pieces hit with the sound of gunshots going off. This is the last time I ask before I start to demand. Who are you playing distraction for? He asks her, and his complete disruption of her abilities has her thoroughly unbalanced and looking at him in a mild state of terror. No, you, you wouldn't... She begins, and he rolls his eyes before dragging her towards the men's restroom he saw. 
There's some more privacy there and a more closed in area helps instill the claustrophobic effect to help with an interrogation. Police officers, nobody move. A voice through a loudspeaker bellows out. Help, he's crazy, he has a gun. The stone screams out in panic. He tried to defend us from you, you crazy bitch. One of Herbert's wives shouts out in immediate response. Herbert sighs and lowers the gun before looking oddly at the stoned. I win. She mouths at him and he can only smirk. Stupid bitch doesn't know that his visor has been recording everything. That's what you think, he remarks before holding up his plasma pistol by the barrel to hand to the officer who just rushed over. The platinum woman has the force fields embedded in her natural armor glowing so brightly she almost looks like a walking force field herself. Hello, officer. I believe these events are in fact a distraction from other affairs, so you will have my complete and total cooperation, although I beg you to keep at least some of your forces on the alert for something unusual happening elsewhere. He's crazy. A mad gunman tried to flash fry me with plasma, she screams. Perhaps the video surveillance coupled with my own recordings of the event in question would be enlightening, Herbert asks as cool as a cucumber. You've recorded this? The officer asks dubiously. I'm an agent of the undaunted. When I'm out of my private accommodations, I'm recording everything that happens at all times. Herbert explains, tapping his visor and causing it to take on its stealthy, dark, gray, non-reflective state. I see. And what is an agent of the undaunted doing here? And let go of the woman, please, the officer says, and Herbert lets go of the Araminta. The girl immediately pulls at the hypocrite and his arm snaps back out again in a blur of movement and cuts off the axiom flow. He also tackles the officer and feels the force field slam into each other and start to heat up his jacket as he smells something cooking while getting all three of them out of the way of the hypercrete chunk. If it's all the same to you, officer, I think I'll hold on to her until we can get her into some axiom-disrupting restraints. Herbert remarks as he watches the big hypercrete chunk settle a little more in the floor. Also, I think we may need to get a team to stop that thing from smashing through a few levels. You're serious. The officer states and the stoned outright kicks Herbert to try and break his grip, but he's unmoved. He's been hit harder in a pillow fight. Granted, the enormous asshole had pressed a pillow against his head and decked him through it, but the point stands. Look, ma'am, I want to continue my vacation and we're shipping out tomorrow. I want this over and dealt with within the hour, if it's at all possible, he says, and the officer then starts to call it in. Is it over? One of his girls asks from above. After the initial scare, they had started taking up ambush positions and were ready to pounce. Yes, come out of position, please. I've got the idiot in a very firm grip, Herbert says and the officer doesn't even flinch to find herself suddenly surrounded by Dzaden and Yaoya. Very well, if you could come this way, with the girl please, then I'll have her, and you in axiom disrupting restraints, the officer states. Certainly, although if you don't mind, I would like to take my jacket off before you put the restraints on me. I have a great deal of tools in here, and it would be akin to an explosion. Herbert says, and the officer nods. This way, please, we will take your warning into account and ensure that the security footage is gone through thoroughly and efficiently, she says, and Herbert nods. You bastard, you can't do this to me. The girl protests and Herbert sighs. Even on vacation, I'm stopping idiots from committing crimes. Too much of this and I'll need a vacation from my vacation. 